Okay, well, welcome to Toon Lark's live event. I'm Kate Johnston, Director of Instructor Programs here. And I'm delighted to be hosting these live events. We're doing several of them a week. We have people doing demonstrations, interviews, master classes, showcases, webinars, and more. So we hope that you will join us uh, as we move along and do these over, over the next many months. Um, be on the lookout for our holiday gift cards. It's a great time to give the gift of music. So look to TuneLark to provide an instructor for you to get started on a dream that you've been thinking about. Today, we're gonna to be featuring Jan Shapiro, who teaches voice with us at TuneLark. And we'll begin this interview by actually listening to one of Jan's recordings. She's a, uh, been a fabulous recording artist for a long time and has an illustrious career that we'll learn a little bit more about. But let's just take a moment just to listen to her beautiful rendition of Little Butterfly. Softer than silk And as warm as warm Beautiful, Jan. Thank you. Um, I'd love to start out with a question about uh, how did you get your start in music? Oh, ever since I was a little girl. Uh, I'm the oldest of four. My mother played piano. Actually, on both sides of my family, there are musicians, but my um, and my grandfathers, both of them, one played violin, one sang. Uh, but uh, my mother was very excellent pianist and she also sang. And uh, so when I was little, being the youngest, I mean the oldest, she said um, that she remembered that when she would play something, a little melody or something, I would be just like two, but I would um, hum it back. She said, I thought, oh, well, maybe that's what all kids do. But she says, no, but the other ones didn't do that. Anyway, so I, we all was just grew up with music and, um, uh, and I, it, then she took, we were in a little town and believe it or not, she took my sister and I two years apart to dance lessons, but they had a recital and they wanted someone to sing. Well, I could sing in tune. So that, so when I was five, I was singing and then I just kept singing. Uh, I kept singing, but um, of course I didn't always know what I was doing correctly at all until much later. I didn't start taking uh, lessons, voice lessons, and until um, I was 15, and I um, had no idea uh, this the teacher in this little town who was so excellent changed my life because she was strict too. I like strict. Strict is good. Nice, but strict, yes. So that's how I started and it just continued on. Um, so I know that, that you've made a beautiful career uh, out of this and I'd love to hear some of the standout moments in your career. We've got plenty of time. So tell us some of the- Oh, okay, let me see. Um, well, one of the, um, you know, I, I sang. Uh, so when I started, uh, I had, as everyone does when you're younger, you get very confused about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So, um, but I kept taking uh, voice lessons, uh, but I didn't finish my degree because I um, met this piano player um, and I started singing. So at first I played guitar and sang and I didn't even know it was time to take a break. 
when I, that was my first job. And I just kept singing. I was very Fanny Folk, very Peter, Paul and Mary. And I just sang and um, I didn't know I was supposed to like take a break. And then I went, oh no, I don't know any more songs. So then I just had to repeat them. But anyway, that was, and then I met the piano player. Then I started sitting in and the next thing you know, I'm working weekends and the next thing you know, I'm working six nights a week. That was back in the day. And um, so then I traveled. Um, so we, we called it on the road. You didn't have to be famous to be on the road, but you had to be good. I, I'll say that in most cases, but there were a lot of hotels and fancy ones like the higher regencies and those places. One of the ones that stood out to me was the one in Chicago it was called the Drake Hotel. And when we were in back in my hometown, St. Louis, singing every night at like this Hilton with a group and I'm singing this, I contacted this agent. Um, the rest of the group probably would have never done that. And he came from Chicago. So they were the third largest agency in the country at that time. Uh, Willie Morris or the second ABC booking. And this guy came in and heard me. Then he called me up and said, I have this job at the Drake Hotel. That used to be where all the famous people were. Of course, things change in the 70s. So it wasn't like that. Now it was more, you know, a lot of rock 70s. So that stood out to me because not only did he come, but the um, variety, which no one, of course, that's listening to this knows what that was, but variety newspaper, the, that was like the showbiz paper from New York. That was a big thing. And I got a little write up, a few sentences that in, in there. And then I also, um, and, and a, at that time, William Morris Agency, they had a, a office in Chicago and the guy came to see me. That was a big thing to me. I was like, oh my God, you know, yeah. And uh, I, I couldn't believe it, yeah. And my name was like, usually no one says anything, but like at the hotel with the big marquee, it had a big giant picture of me and lights. And I was like, oh my, that, so that was a big thing to me. I was like, I don't know. And of course I wish, and when I saw the picture, when I see the picture of myself and I'm going, Oh, that's so creepy. It looks just like someone took it, from, you know, like a friend of mine. And it was, it was not very good picture, but I'm like, oh, well, I didn't. Only later did they say, you have to get better pictures, but they put the creepy picture in there. But, you know, I was still like, that was a big moment. Another big moment for me was when uh, that was to me, one of the biggest that I couldn't believe. And then the other one was later in Boston, I just came to Berkeley. And that after the first year, I was making my living mostly singing pop, but venturing into jazz. And so they asked me to sing at the Boston Globe Jazz Festival. And I'm like, they're asking me to do it. Oh, no, I'm not jazz enough. I don't think I'm good enough for jazz. But, um, but I did it. And then they asked me again. So that was like so two different times of a span of years. Those were probably my, my uh, biggest in the performing. And the only other thing was when I met, um, uh, another one was the Grammy Award winner that was a colleague of mine at the same time I came to Berkeley, Richard Evans. And we became friends and I asked him to do an arrangement of two songs. And when I was in the studio with him at Berkeley, they had these great studios there. And the other thing that happened is, is he just came over and they were like hardcore. One was called Bopplicity, which is a, for those who don't know, which is I think was a, uh, a hardcore jazz, you know? So I had had the score and I read it after I was done. We had, there were some horn players in there, uh, notable. And he goes, Jan, I'm taking over your project. And I'm like, okay, um, I don't know, but okay. So, um, and he did, he took it over. So I thought I was gonna do a certain kind of thing with just piano and voice and do just jazz, learning jazz. And he switched it all around and I'm like, but so those were the, I think the most that I can think of that were sort of a surprise to me that I wasn't, uh, 
uh, thinking actually about at that time. I think I was so fortunate and I came in at the end of an era. So that meant that all the people I knew that were older than me taught me a lot by all their experience when I worked with them. And I worked every night, Monday through Saturday, usually four hours. So if you didn't have the stamina vocally, you wouldn't make it. You would, you know, and today, um, I don't know that people, they just like can't even believe that. Even students that you sang every night. I said, I did, but I was in really good shape and I did everything I was supposed to that my teachers taught me and that I teach. I really, and I really did. Um, and honored also vocally, you know, the hard part was when you're younger, you think when you hear whatever is playing that you're going to sing it and that you'll be okay with that. But I always compare it to like, if you're a flute or if you're a trombone player or an acoustic bass, okay, um, there's some elements of each, but if you are a flute, then you have to be a good flute, but you can't be a trombone because it's doesn't, it's not gonna sound that way. So I think that that's hard for today's people when they hear something that has tons more now of MIDI and all kind of um, tracks that are not even real people. And so, and then I call it trickery, tricks with the voice. So then then you get a young person and they don't know that. So they're wondering why their voice won't do that. Well, it's just, that's, so I think that um, all of that was a good experience and learning from those, uh, all those experienced players that you can't, you cannot replicate that. And that um, you had to learn to have stamina and how to use your voice if you're gonna work six nights a week. And uh, I did it. Well, I also love what so many times the things that you mentioned there that were special to you were things that took you by surprise. I like the way you said that because um, if you're open to that, that's where some of these, these pathways lead, which is great. And speaking of pathways, I know that you had a long and distinguished career at Berkeley. Uh, as well as part of being uh, part of that being head of the voice department. I'd love for you to tell us how you ended up in that position and a little bit about that experience. Yeah, it just was, again, that was another surprise because, um, so now it's like 1979, 80, 81, 82, um, I married a musician the pianist, so convenient. But anyway, so, um, and I had two sons, two years apart. So when the second one came along, I was still working every night. And even, except back in those days, you had to hide, you know, if you showed, I had to just keep wearing big dresses. So, um, but like, um, I saw that things were changing. I really could see it that there weren't as much live music or what they would do. If you had five pieces, they would cut it down. So during the week, there would be like piano and voice. And then we could add the rest of the band only on weekends. It started doing that. Um, and I saw that also. Um, and I started thinking about that. But also then I got asked to teach locally. So, if, but I worried about that having two sons or children, you know, thinking, how is this gonna be? been working for ourselves this whole time. And that's how I, um, so I wound up teaching at a small college in St. Louis, just one day a week teaching private lessons. And um, sometimes I'd bring some of the local musicians in to help a company to expose them to, uh, to blues and jazz as well, um, and, as well as classical, of course. But um, and, uh, then, I did a couple of clinics and got asked through the, at that time, the head of Southern Illinois University. So um, after I did a few clinics uh, there, he asked me to teach. And I, so one day a week, I went across the river, across the bridge and taught there, but I still sang every night. But I was thinking about this. So that would be like, you know, 1980. And then after I had the second child, I got to thinking about this. So I just watched how the music was changing. Um, and uh, I worried about that because I liked it just the way it was, but um, I liked teaching very much. And there was a colleague of mine at the 
Southern Illinois University. We did some gigs together. And he said, hey, he saw me in the hall and said, I, I saw this ad in one of the journals, music journals, and uh, they're looking for a voice teacher. Boy, you'd be perfect for that. And I go, really? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, they wouldn't, you know, I don't have my master's. You probably have to have a graduate. I don't have that. I started to go back for it. I just couldn't do that work six nights and five nights. And the, as things change and with uh, two little ones, I, I tried to, and I just thought, I can't do this. So I thought, oh, so for some reason, I just went ahead. I did a lot of demos for other people and I sent that and Berkeley called me. The chair of the voice note called me and I'm like, what? Weird. But I had been teaching and teaching some at home, you know, but I didn't know advertising. I didn't advertise. And they, that's how it happened. They asked me. So they flew me there and put me in the fancy, fancy hotel. I was very impressed. Except the offer was so lame. I thought, no way. I can't afford this. So I said, no. But things changed. And a year later, they had a new dean of faculty who I met and loved, Dr. Warwick Carter. Um, and he called me personally up and said, the chair of the department, and it was a little bitty voice department at Berkeley. It was nothing, so tiny. They didn't even know what they should do, what they needed. There was not really any curriculum. So he called me and said, they still think you should come. You, you should, we would like to have you come. And I go, it's, it's so expensive. I don't, that, you know, I, I'm making more salary now. I can't do that and move. And, you know, I mean, move everything, my piano, everything. Um, okay, we'll pay to move you here. That never happened, will never happen again either. He did it and I said, okay. And that's how I wound up there. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I just left and went. And I, even though there were still jobs, I came back for a couple of them, like some big band jobs that were, con I contracted jobs and I got real into it with the music business part. I did it. I, I, I booked myself in another, and and uh, in a in another group sometimes, so um, I that's how it happened. I wound up there and was and I I learned a lot from the other instrumentalists and other departments as well. Um, and um, I wound up being there for thirty one years. Yeah, and then in like in nineteen ninety six, I became acting chair, and then became the chair. Um, uh, and at that time, there weren't very many women that were department chairs at all, actually none. So um, they were kind of creepy. They didn't know that they were, but they were like everywhere, like the workplace. I mean, and also because it was singers and singers to them was not the same. The, sing the instrumentals were here and the singers was considered like that. Oh, well, just a singer. And I wanted the singers to be good musicians. I didn't want them to be because they were a singer that they were less than. And I was, I was a woman with a mission, totally with a mission. So I spent a whole lot of time on that. I didn't get to sing very much because I got really, I was driven about it. Um, I really didn't care about my title. I just cared if I was going to take the job. And when I took when I did it in the summer, when I was acting chair, I thought, this is really hard. I don't even know if I want this job. It's creepy. You don't even have time for anything. And there's, it's hard to even fit in teaching. Or, and the paperwork was like, and that was before uh, a lot of automation and computers. So a lot of written or typing. And I went like, oh no, this is like too much. But a few of my friends in the department said, no, you have to, you have to do it because you have a vision about this and you have to do it. But I, I was not sure I wanted to take it, but I did take it. Well, it sounds like you made it a very different uh, voice department by the time you were done. 
Oh, I did. I totally did. Yeah. I totally did. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And the only other thing that was uh, about my, as I say now, uh, I think that, you know, I didn't finish my, I got sidetracked a little bit um, because, uh, well, just family that, you know, we're afraid about, I can't believe you're doing this as a living. You won't, maybe you won't make it and everything. So it took me a while. Anyway, I didn't finish my undergrad. So like early on in 70, I was on the road, contacted my voice teacher. I want to finish my degree in music. So um, the other funny thing about this is that I wound up at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and they gave me a scholarship there. I couldn't believe it, but um, to finish. Um, but in those days, people would like, you're what? You're going where? I go, yeah, so. But like to them, like since Howard University was notable, but because it wasn't, it was not, it was for our American Black students more no one ever thought about um you know it wasn't very uh integrated which i understood but um i loved it and i loved my teachers and my teacher i told him he had to teach me which he did he also when i was i also had to sing every night to pay my rent uh for an apartment so one time i he i was doing classical Aria and it was my turn to do the recital, but that now, you know, that night, the nights before I'm singing late night and get home at one o'clock or later. And I was ready and he ran through with the pianist for me to do the recital. Um, and I sang and he pulled me off of it. He goes, you're, you're, you're laying back behind the beat on that aria. And I went, well, I'm trying to get my jazz style. And I got all, I was tired and I got all mixed up. He pulled me off. I'll never forget that. I was like, that was quite a lesson. Oh, that's so funny. Well, I think what would be great right now is for you, if you don't mind, to sing a little something for us to uh, polish this off. It's been great to hear about your journey. And mm -hmm. yeah. Well, of course, you know, singing just live through the waves won't be the same. No. Um, and I, and I, I can't say, I, I try to think, well, I don't know what would be a, a, a song. Um, should I do a jazz tune? Um, uh, or, uh, because now I'm a chorus, I do probably more of that, but I did make my living singing pop, but pop was different then than it is now. But still, um, I have a lot of students that do a lot of pop and, and, uh, some that sing a lot of backup for famous people. Um, let me see what I have here that I could do a short segment. Let me get a drink of water. So I thought of something that um, probably most people won't know, which is kind of good, maybe in the 70s. Let's see if I can do maybe the last half if I don't mess it up. Uh, Would 
Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, do this interview and share a little bit about your life story with music. Um, everyone is so incredibly unique and to realize that you spent your life doing it and taken advantage of surprise opportunities. I think that's inspiring to everyone who wants to do music, however, to whatever capacity, so. That's correct, yes. Music yeah. is important. It, it lifts the soul, I think. It sure does. Well, thank you so much, Jen. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And we'll see you later. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.